after book four, Plato's Republic, you might be wondering, what more is there to do? There's still another six books left of the Republic after Socrates has given the answer as to what the definition of justice is. It's helpful to think of the Republic as maybe circular or as kind of a a pyramid ascending and then descending, where each of the books actually correspond to each other in that book one corresponds to ten, two, to nine, and so on. Except you have right in the middle kind of, some people talk about the Republic as like an onion. You have right in the middle, actually, uh, Once you've even tackled the question as to what the nature of justice is, you have a kind of deconstruction of the city of Kallipolis, Um, a further inquiry, a further uh, kind of, you know, critique in terms of asking what are the limits, probing uh, the ideal city that Socrates and his interlocutors have discussed, and challenges to uh, the city that occupy basically... Uh, books five through seven. So book five then is the first beginning the kind of critique of Callipolis now, uh, whether it can stand up uh, to scrutiny. And in many ways, book five central to it is what Mary Townsend calls uh, the woman question. So the woman question is basically uh, comes from the 19th century and it has to do with, um, you know, whether women deserve political rights, uh, what that would look like if they deserve full, equal political rights, whether they, if, like, let's say they have the right to vote. Well, what all does that entail? Uh, is it uh, politically responsible for them to have the right to vote? So basically, w- what does equality entail? Um, but we should also think about not just this question being asked, but who is asking the question? Where is it coming from? Right? To what extent is Glaucon pushing this? To what extent might it be Socrates? Then we can think about Plato, and we can think about as well the perspective of the silent you know, voice of, of uh, women in the Republic as well in relation to that question. So book five concerns what is the role of women in the Republic and in Callipolis. Now, the first mention is actually, or the first kind of hint as to this, uh, the importance of uh, the, the moral and political equality of the sexes, is in the very first line of the Republic. When Socrates says, I went down to the Piraeus yesterday with Glaucon, son of Ariston, to pray to the goddess. And he mentions it's a goddess that the, the, a festival the Thracians have put on. Who is that goddess? It's actually Bendis, who was a Thracian warrior goddess. So already, from the very beginning, the question of what is justice, what is the ideal city, begins within the context of worshipping a, a goddess that is then, because she is a goddess, equal to right, the male version of a, you know, a god. So already, then, this, this whole question is uh, within the context of the, the, the question of the moral and political equality of the sexes. There's also a kind of indirect mention of women in uh, the construction of the city of necessity, when it's mentioned basically that, um, you know, men, basically, they, they uh, take in sex to uh, procreate, to preserve, of course, you know, to, to give birth to new ki- children and preserve uh, the city. And then now, explicitly, uh, women uh, are brought up in Book 5 and the question of uh, the moral and political status of women in the ideal city. So it is claimed that there is moral equality of, uh, in education of the sexes. The sexes, men and women are to be given the same kind of an education if they are the, the guardian class, right? A little bit different if they are the, they are the auxiliaries. Um, and not just the same education, but there's to be equality in the positions held in society. So you have, right, female guardians just like male guardians, and even then female rulers just like male rulers. The question is, 
is this really possible? So it's already Socrates uh, uh, claims, right, that uh, uh, through his argumentation, kind of uh, a lot of it indirectly, that there is moral equality um, of the sexes. Therefore, there should be political equality. Is this really possible? We have a few lines I want to read here. So Socrates says, for it could be doubted that the things said are possible. And even if in the best possible conditions they could come into being, that they would be what is best will also be doubted. So that this is why there's a certain hesitation about getting involved in it, for fear that the argument might seem to be a prayer, my dear comrade. So we have in political philosophy not just questions uh, of how things ought to be, but political philosophy has to take into account the relation between how things ought to be, so the ideal uh, maybe organization of society, and how things actually are, or, or what the limits of nature are, such that we take into account the ideal, and in that sense, then the non-ideal. Socrates also says, perhaps compared to what is habitual, many of the things now being said would look ridiculous if they were to be done as is said. So he, he's, he's trying to take into account, right? What is the kind of common assumption? What are the norms of uh, Athenian men, how they view women? Someone like um, uh, uh, Aris, uh, pl sorry, Plato's brothers, uh, Glaucon and Adamantus, and especially Adamantus, who think of, uh, m they validate more of the traditional uh, sex, sexual uh, roles of the sexes. Glaucon is a bit more willing to go uh, along with what Socrates is um, proposing. But nonetheless, Socrates is taking seriously, if we show through philosophical argumentation that there is moral equality between, or there should be moral equality between the sexes. What about the fact that most men in Athens, right, it, it's the norm then, don't think so? Well, we can't just then discount the fact that because most men might think that's ridiculous, that it could never come to be that there is uh, a realization of the moral equality of the sexes. Because as Socrates says, uh, uh, it, it used to be um, uh, that, like he says, but since we've begun to speak, we must beg these men to be serious and reminding them that it is not so long ago that it seemed shameful and ridiculous to the Greeks as it does now to many among the barbarians to see men naked. You know, talking about when they would do gymnastics and things like that, being uh, 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 naked, it seemed ridiculous. And yet now it's the norm. So norms can be overturned. Part of the question then is, if you're going to argue for the moral equality of the sexes, how do you actually make this, how do you bring this into reality? Well, it is possible some things that might uh, seem far-fetched, if you know you have a very sexist society, it might seem far-fetched then to have society um, you know, uh, uh, enable the moral equality of the sexes. It, that would seem ridiculous. And yet sometimes we can do things that seem ridiculous. And yet, you know, it, it's possible. So what is the argument given in defense of the equality of the sexes by uh, Socrates then? So Socrates and Glaucon did agree that each must mind their own business according to nature, right? When it comes to the definition of justice. Is this claim, uh, uh, how does this work? Is it compatible? Because it is the case, Socrates, according to the tripartite soul, that women have the exact same uh, a soul as, as men. If they have the exact same soul as men, then they have a rational part. They have the part of the soul then that can govern the rest of uh, uh, the soul, the spirited part and the appetitive part. So it would seem then that whatever is in the capacity of men, insofar as they possess reason, women do as well. Socrates says, then if either the class of men or that of women shows his superiority in some art or other practice, then we'll say that that art must be assigned to it. But if they look as though they differ in this alone, that the female bears and the male mounts, we'll assert that it has not thereby yet been proved that a woman differs from a man with respect to what we're talking about. Rather, we'll still suppose that our guardians and their women must practice the same things. So, so he basically says that even if it 
We have to take into account custom and culture. So if we say that the female bears and the male mounts, is this necessary? Does it have to be this way? Just because we say that something happens, uh, you know, naturally, so to speak, that doesn't mean it has to continue to be that way. We say women are in charge of raising children. Well, it doesn't mean that it has to be that way. So that alone is not enough to disprove the moral and political equality of the sexes. And yet, though, there still is this appeal to nature, as is just common in all of the ancient world. So we have an argument in defense of the equality of the sexes, uh, given by Socrates. But what do we still make of the other parts of sexism still in the text? For example, when Socrates says, But lighter parts of these tasks must be given to the women than the men because of the, weaknesses, uh, because of the weakness of the class. So basically, well, uh, we have to say that because the nature is slightly different, uh, whether it be their physiology or whatever, for women, uh, even though we say they're equal, their task then is going to be left uh, less to correspond to them. Is that something that Socrates or even Plato, you know, we don't know, Plato is silent, he's not uh, a character in the dialogue. Is this something actually being advocated? Should we think of this as a noble lie? Maybe, you know, how, how could you convince Athenian uh, men that uh, women should be given equal and political moral status, right? Th they're most likely just going to laugh at that, think that's ridiculous. So maybe you have to introduce a noble lie in the same way that Socrates did earlier, where you say, yeah, yeah actually there's moral and political equality, but some things, you know, well, it's a little bit different and women should be given lesser tasks. Does that function to kind of subvert sexism in society where you actually kind of make it such that formally women have equal moral and political status without making it explicit such that men would be more likely to challenge that such that they can go uh, still go along with it with this kind of a noble lie that there has to women have to be given um, lesser weight, you know, or, or, or have to be given tax, uh, tasks that are, are lighter in nature? Um, maybe that's a strategic question, a, a political strategic question. But it also then to this extent is a philosophical question in terms of how do you go about um, marrying basically theory and practice if you can show through rational argumentation that there ought to be moral and political equality of the sexes. How do you actually go about implementing that? Because you still have to take into account the psychological makeup of all the individuals in the city. Because what is um, a city but a collection of individuals and, and their psychological makeups? I mean, we see this in the definition of justice because it is linked to right the city-soul analogy. We talk about justice in the city in relation to then uh, the just individuals in the city. And we see their kind of psychological makeup in terms of uh, to what extent... They're rational, they are spirited, uh, to what part and when, um, and, and in what ways different parts of the soul then, or the psyche, are in charge of um, different tasks. And then what is their disposition, such that they are to think in certain ways, right? Uh, Socrates in different dialogues speaks of unburdening those uh, who carry around the opinions of others. So is this a kind of a way where, you know, is Socrates placating a little bit of sexism here for the sake of, in the long run, undermining uh, sexism uh, in social and political life. Um, or, you know, this has traditionally been something criticized by feminists. But I think, for example, Mary Townsend, she wants to point to these examples and to say, look, actually, Plato is taking head on the question, taking it seriously. Um, that women deserve moral equal and uh, political uh, and moral equal status, but also trying to take seriously, well, what are the kinds of implications in society beyond just the formal arguments um, themselves? There is some evidence as well to, to, to back up the claim that Plato is genuinely interested in 
uh, this kind of moral equality of the sexes. Um, we know that Plato, for example, allowed women into the academy uh, to be educated in actual practice. Um, someone like Aristotle, for example, did not. There are also different um, cases in the, in the different dialogues, like in the Symposium, for example. When Socrates gives the famous account of uh, beauty and the theory of the forms in, as it's uh, presented in the Symposium, it's through the voice of Diotima, a woman, that is giving this account of the theory of the forms. When we look at the Menexenus, for example, in that dialogue, it is a woman who is said to have actually written uh, the famous speech that Pericles gives, that everybody, uh, uh, everyone in Athenian society regarded as a rhetorical masterpiece. And yet in the Menexenus, Plato has Socrates, uh, Plato has written it such that Socrates is saying, actually, it was a woman who had written that uh, 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 rhetorical masterpiece. You know, what, what do we make of those kinds of um, interventions of the female character in the dialogues? So that was the first wave, the first um, challenge that is brought by uh, uh, Glaucon and Adamantus and, and all the other interlocutors as to um, whether Callipolis is sound, whether it can hold up to a challenge of, of some of the things that it requires being ridiculous. And Socrates tries to explain how actually uh, it is defensible to have the moral and political equality of the sexes. The second wave, though, that is brought to uh, Callipolis, and, and they're called waves because Socrates speaks of being afraid that it will these these uh, three critiques will drown the city. The second wave that is faced is the abolition of the family. So very important in the construction of the ideal city is its stability. And it is mentioned that traditional marriages um, and, and traditional families encourage emotional ties between individuals. When, you know, it's just likely if you have a child, you are going to want to better your child over some stranger's child. And a lot of times this is where corruption occurs, where we want to favor, even if someone doesn't deserve it, we want to favor them because they're our child. So, you know, this occurs all the time where, let's say a child of a, a, a sheriff um, or a politician um, gets like a DUI, you know, gets pulled over by a cop or whatever. They will try and basically, kind of, you know, just do me some favors, sweep that under the rug so my kid doesn't get in trouble, right? Certain things like that where it's, it just seems natural. It occurs in all generations where uh, parents and family members will favor their, uh, their kin. That then is going to undermine the stability of treating the city as a, a whole and not as a collection of individuals. So an implication of, of the woman question as to uh, the question of whether there can uh, and should be moral and political equality of the sexes in the ideal city is then whether the family should be held in common. And that is advocated, um, you know, back in uh, book two, for example, uh, and, and, and three as well, um, it's uh, clarified that there should be uh, the family held in common. I mean, we get in, in or sorry, it's actually book three, right? With the introduction of the myth of the metals, it's mentioned that um, children are to be raised communally, that no one is to know that the child, once it's born, is to be taken away. No one then is to know what child belongs to whom. And this is how you combat the problem of traditional marriages and families. This is also one of the other famous examples of where people say communism is in um, the Republic. But if, the, if there is to be complete equality of, of the sexes, then it shouldn't be the case that child uh, rearing is left to women alone, right? It should be actually equally done between uh, women and men. So it shouldn't just be the case that women uh, uh, bear the burden of um, having to care for children and raise them. They, they should have just as many opportunities open to them as men have. So men should be responsible for raising uh, children as well. Now, of course, the problem, though, is that men can't actually um, give birth. So you also have problems of, well, what if you have a single parent? And then all of the onus is left to um, uh, the, the, the female. 
So if you have children raised communally, then you're going to free up every individual to pursue their own interest in, in excellency for what, you know, whether they're going to be good at uh, being an educator, whether they're going to be good at uh, being a doctor, whatever else it may be, they are free to pursue those things for the good of the city. Socrates says, there's a need for the best men to have intercourse as often as possible with the best women, and the reverse for the most ordinary men with the most ordinary women, and the offspring of the former must be reared, but not that of others, if the flock is going to be of the most eminent quality. And all this must come to pass without being noticed by anyone except the rulers themselves, if the guardian's herd is to be as free as possible from faction. So no guardian is allowed to have sex with another at any other time of the year than the festival. They are allowed to have sex then, uh, to then, of course, um, uh, have children, but they're not going to know whose child belongs to whom because it's going to be taken away. So there is also an aspect of eugenics um, that's involved in the city of Callipolis uh, as well to produce the best uh, natures. So, so... Uh, those who can, uh, who are best suited, right, to be guardians or auxiliaries or in the working class are, 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 are identified as such based on their nature because maybe you had two people in the working class um, uh, give birth and so you recognize this child is going to, um, you know, uh, be, be raised within the working class. Um, although, of course, it was admitted sometimes uh it's up to the guardians to identify a child as actually uh, maybe it should belong in a higher class and to move that child to a higher class. Um, but regardless, right? I mean, Socrates is advocating eugenics. So we, we have a lot of things going on here in Callipolis with these challenges in book five as to the nature of the city and whether it's realistic or not. We have uh, the advocation of the moral and political equality of the sexes. We have the advocation of um, families, uh, uh, the traditional family being broken up for the family to be held in common. Is this realistic, right? I mean, this is something that, um, Mary Townsend, for example, speaks of as being kind of the operatic quality of book five of the Republic, because Socrates wants to say, yes, uh, this is possible. It's, it's for the good of, uh, uh the city. And yet, is that true? You know, we have to ask ourselves, is it possible that children could be held in common? Or is it kind of in our nature to want to raise, to have this kind of um, natural tie to uh, our offspring that you can't just get rid of something like that through education, right? So what are the limits of education? Uh, what are the limits of, of, of the power of nurture in relation to the power of nature? So this is, is you know, if, if you believe Mary Townsend, these kinds of questions Plato is raising and taking seriously as to if you have the four more, uh, full moral and political equality of women, um, how do we actually deal with some of these issues that arise in real political life? And to some extent, Townsend thinks Plato is, is really leaving some of this open because he thinks it's a serious question that we have to think about, but he's not entirely sure. Um, so, so that's a question to you, right? Is that actually possible? Is the family being held in common actually possible? Now we have um, in the defense of, uh, in, in rebutting the second wave, in the defense of the family being held in common, uh, Socrates mentions that the guardians are meant to treat everything as if it's their own, like they would their own body, and so it makes sense that you would have the family in common in order to prevent stasis, this kind of internal conflict in the city. So Socrates says, won't lawsuits and complaints against one another virtually vanish from among them thanks to their possessing nothing private but the body, while the rest is in common? On this basis, they will then be free from faction to the extent, at any rate, that human beings divide into factions over the possession of money, children, and relatives. So, another question. Is that actually possible um, to treat everything as your own? Aristotle, in The Politics, actually says that if everybody is your friend, 
then nobody is your friend. If everybody is your family, then nobody is your family. That it is not in our nature to treat everyone in that kind of um, intimate way that is the mark of, for example, what it means to be a family member or what it is to be the mark of a friend. Is that actually possible? Is that ideal? Maybe we could say this is ideal. This is what would occur if we had... um, Uh, a a city fully uh, realizing justice. But to what extent is that possible uh, in real life, right? To what extent does nature come up against uh, the ideal? So Socrates, um, at least according to Glaucon and the interlocutors, uh, they go along with the rebuttals to the first and the second wave. The final wave, the third wave, is the paradox of philosopher kings. And basically the paradox is this. Only the ruler of philosopher kings can make a city just and happy. Right? Because it requires education, and the the requisite kind of education is made only possible in the ideal city. The problem is, you can only have the institutions that enable that education if you already have philosopher kings ruling to organize the city in such a way as to promote that kind of an education. So the paradox is only the rule of philosopher kings can make a city just and happy, and yet only the just and happy city can make possible the rule of philosopher kings. Right? It's that kind of uh, chicken and egg problem. What comes first? It seems then that the city of Calypolis, the ideal city, is impossible. Because you can't yet have a philosopher king without already having the ideal city. Books 6 and 7 are more or less uh, meant to address this third wave. But it's also worth noting that this is still a continuation. The third wave is still a continuation of the woman question, the woman uh, 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 problem, because... Uh, women are to rule as well. In the same way that with uh, that Thracian goddess, uh, she is equal among all the other kind of uh, uh, men gods, right? In the godly realm, uh, male and female gods are equal. Well, in the ideal city, uh, you have male and female rulers who are equal. You have both an, uh, a male and female philosophers and therefore philosopher kings. How is it possible then to have this? How is it possible to have this ideal scenario? What that's going to consist in is understanding what the nature of the philosopher is. So what the philosopher actually is, what they do, and how it's possible to become a philosopher. Socrates ends book five by explaining first what the philosopher does not do, what other um, people who are interested in learning Uh, what the nature of that kind of learning is and how that differs from the kind of learning that a philosopher is interested in. So Socrates says that all the arts and the crafts and what he calls practical endeavors consist of those who are lovers of sights. So they they love um, uh, kind of the appearances, going back to that essence-appearance distinction. They are interested in the appearances of things. And he gives an example of that being painters. And he says, painters are lovers of the sight of beauty. They're not lovers of beauty itself. Socrates says, the lovers of hearing and the lovers of sight, on the one hand, surely delight in fair sounds and colors and shapes and all that craft makes from such things. But their thought is unable to see and delight in the nature of the fair itself. The painter is not interested in what is the nature of beauty. The painter is interested in painting as well as possible. Now, we'll see this uh, come back again in book 10, because a painter is basically going to be a kind of imitator. Art was understood in the Greek world to be a form of uh, imitation, a representation of that which is more real. So the idea is, uh, if you're a carpenter, for example... You are using the laws of nature uh, to be able to build things. You're not interested in the laws of nature. You're interested in representing the laws of nature. For example, creating structures uh, that humans can use. A philosopher is going to be someone who is interested in the things themselves. 
the essences behind the appearance. So since the powers of knowledge, and it's going to be the mark of a philosopher that they possess knowledge, since the powers of knowledge and opinion are capable of something different, and so we would say that uh, opinion is then ignorance of knowledge, not knowing, they are naturally dependent on different things, Socrates says. So we would say knowledge depends on what is, right? It, what is its object? That which is, right? That which is uh, et eternal. That's what an essence is. It's something eternal, universal. Knowledge is to know of what is, and uh, that, sorry, that it is, and how it is. Opinion depends on appearances, not essences. Ignorance is a lack of dependence on anything. It depends on that which is not. This is a famous issue. Can there be that which is not? That's taken up in different dialogues, like the sophist, for example. But what's happening here is Socrates is making a distinction. The mark of a philosopher is to be interested in what is, uh, the essences of things, whereas those that opine are interested in the appearances of things. And opinion is something in between knowledge and ignorance. So we wouldn't say someone that has an opinion of things, that is interested in the appearances of things, like uh, carpenters, um, athletes, uh, uh, doctors, whatever else, right? Uh, what are called arts. They're not um, scientific pursuits. They're more um, of a different kind of, um, they wouldn't call it science back then, but a kind of craft. Something that requires practical wisdom as opposed to scientific wisdom, if we uh, use that kind of um, Aristotelian distinction. And the question is going to be then, what exactly is opinion, right? How can you have knowledge, if knowledge is uh, that of what is, how can you have um, a kind of knowledge, which would be opinion, of not what is, but something in between? Because what is there a distinct separate object of something that is in between being and not being or is it just solely an epistemological problem but well then what is the object that you are having knowledge of right because what socrates is saying is there's always a kind of correspondence between the thing uh between you knowing something and the thing that you know so what is it that someone is interested in if they have an opinion? So the philosopher, right, to become a philosopher, you know to distinguish between then appearances and essences, going all the way back to book two. The philosopher is a lover of all of learning. So they are interested in appearances, but they don't settle for appearances. Appearances are almost kind of like the, the appetizer that gets the philosopher interested in the main course. Socrates says, the one who is willing to taste every kind of learning with gusto and who approaches learning with delight and is insatiable, we shall justly assert to be a philosopher, won't we? The philosopher then is a lover of truth. Again, Socrates says, won't we assert that these men delight in and love that on which knowledge depends? And the others, non-philosophers, uh, they uh, delight in and love that on which opinion depends. Must we, therefore, call philosophers, rather than lovers of opinion, those who delight in each thing that is itself? The question that ends book five and which leads into book six, then, is what exactly is an appearance? What exactly is that thing which participates in both uh, being and not being, in both to be and not to be, and, and whether there can be a thing at all? And how is it possible to possess knowledge? Because it's only once we know how it's possible to possess knowledge, what the nature of knowledge is, what it means to know, uh, to truly know something. It's only once we know that that we can know whether it's possible for one to become a philosopher and therefore um, for the ideal city uh, to come into being.